So in 2015, my old friend Sheehan asked me to write about the experience of being an Asian American man. We just spent the last couple hours in Union Square catching up. He'd been telling me about his experience as a medical resident and being newly single in New York and how his race colored those experiences. I commiserated, sharing my own stories about the confusing, frustrating, and absurd experiences that come with being an Asian guy. And we both reflected on the fact that these kinds of honest discourses weren't happening in mainstream media. And we agreed that there needed to be more. And Sheehan wondered if maybe I could be one of those voices. Now, I'm a startup founder, not a journalist. And so when I write, it's usually about business or technology. But I could tell that this was important to Sheehan. I knew that I could hear it in his voice that this mattered to him. And so I knew what I had to do. I stayed in my comfort zone and started a research study to collect data about Asian American men. Now, I swear I had good intentions. I wanted a reality check. I wanted to make sure that what I was going to write about was relevant. And so I put a get together a couple questions on a Google form, threw it on social media, and would have been happy if 30 people completed it. Turned out 300 responses rolled in in a couple weeks. My survey had struck a chord. Asian men feel unseen, unheard, and ignored in this country. And when this survey came along with questions that were relevant to their lives, they were excited to share. Over the last couple years, I've heard from more than 1,000 East, Southeast, and South Asian men on everything from parental expectations, stereotypes, media, and more. And the original plan was to throw up a PowerPoint with a couple slides, go over some of the key findings of the research. But this morning isn't the place for that. Today is about the stories behind the statistics. So if you ask Asian guys how their race affects their life, and they're sufficiently honest or sufficiently liquored up, um, they're going to talk about dating. It's generally understood that Asian guys are on one of the lowest rungs of the dating totem pole. We have some of the lowest response rates on OkCupid compared to black men, Asian or white men, and Latino men. Um, and gay Asians have to look for no rice or no curry on Grindr before messaging. And our own research has found that nearly two-thirds of Asian men have heard, I don't date Asian guys, said to them or in their presence. And 20% of guys have heard it six or more times. You know, I know that as men we have a reputation for being dense, but this message is coming through loud and clear. It took me some time to find my own confidence dating as an Asian guy. I remember in college, uh, breaking up with my first girlfriend who's Asian and feeling bummed out. I was on the gymnastics team, and one of my teammates, white boy from Texas, tried to cheer me up. He said, Shen, you're a good-looking guy. You should be cleaning up with the Asian girls on campus. Now, if I had to write a program that could generate statements that were simultaneously racist and sexist, <laughs> that's the kind of thing I would expect to come out. I don't think he meant it. But his implication was that as a white guy, he could and date and did date people from all different backgrounds. But as an Asian guy, I was limited to dating Asian people. So later that semester, when I started dating a white girl, I felt like hot shit. <laughs> she was French, she was a fellow athlete, and she was an East Asian studies major. Now, I know what you're all thinking, but this was not a random hookup. We were together for two years. It was a real relationship. But at the same time, during that process, I was feeling proud of myself for dating a white person. It felt like an achievement, like I was better. And I'll be the first to admit that that kind of thinking was wrong. I'm getting married next month. Thank you. Um, and my fiance is Thai and Indonesian, and she had a similar experience uh, growing up thinking that she was supposed to be attracted to white guys and not to Asian guys. And as she got older, she actually found herself confused when she was feeling, uh, get, developing feelings for Asian guys and being like, what's happening? I thought this wasn't supposed to be the deal. And it, you know, I'm just so grateful that both of us had the self-awareness to recognize this internalized white supremacy and racism and to rewrite those scripts or else we never would have gotten together. So we all know, this room in particular, that media is such a powerful influence on how, uh, what we aspire to do and be. And so one of the questions from our survey was, 
who is the Asian American man you most admire? I mean, think about that for yourselves. If I was to ask you, who is an Asian American man you admire, who has someone in mind? Who, who, raise your hands if you have someone that you can think of. Right? Raise your hands if you're like, oh, that's a good question. Like, who, who would I say? Right? So you're not alone. I mean, when we asked this survey, the number one response was, I can't think of anybody. I don't know. No one comes to mind. Right? The second response was a male relative, brother, father, uncle. The number three person, the first named individual, was Bruce Lee. Now, the male relative one, I totally understand, right? We come from immigrant families. It takes an enormous amount of courage and sacrifice to uproot yourself and bring yourself to a new place in search of a better life. And my father did that, and you know, many of our parents worked super hard to do that. So I, I completely understand why someone would have so much respect for uh, their family in that way. But Bruce Lee was born in 1940. He was, yes, a martial arts uh, expert. He was a Hollywood star. He was cool. He was good-looking. He was well-spoken. And he died young under mysterious circumstances. This is like the perfect storm for creating a legend, right, who lives on forever. But it's been nearly 50 years since he died. Why don't we have anybody else? I mean, take two other people of a similar profile, Jim Morrison of The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, the guitarist. Both of them were extraordinarily successful and famous entertainers who were died young in around the same time that Bruce Lee did. But does anybody think that if we surveyed white guys or black guys that they would say that Morrison or Hendrix were the number one people on their lists? Or that they had no one that they could think of? No fucking way. Now this is on its way to being changed, and, and you know, this conference and you know, all of you are part of that change, right? Henry Golding is on the cover of GQ. Hassan Minaj is doing some of the edgiest and funniest political commentary anywhere. And Andrew Yang is the first Asian American to run for president as a Democrat, and he's going to be on stage yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the debates. Um, so, you know, all the credit in the world and all the respect in the world to Bruce Lee. He will be enshrined forever as one of the Asian men that led the way. But I look forward to the day that we have a new generation of Asian men who we can look up to as role models and as leaders. So going back to that request that Sheehan made of me, I realized that I dodged it because I was scared. What if I spilled my guts and put my stories out there and I just got ridiculed? Or Worse, people just didn't care at all. But I've realized that if we want this country to pay attention to us, to listen to us, to believe in us, we have to believe in ourselves. As, as I've been working on this Asian American man study, I've found the courage and, and learning how to not just report the numbers, but to tell the stories, to tell my story. And I hope you all have the opportunity to tell yours. Thank you.